someone asked us about uh, um, alopecia areata and PRP, but I guess it's a good time to transition to that. Not that I want to talk about myself, but I mean, I think people have been watching how I've you know, posted certain videos about it. I've been very vocal about it, telling them that you're my treating doctor and no pressure. But, you know, I'm happy to share more about this specifically because I was just, I was excited to learn about that treatment that, you know, you put me on and, and just the fact that it even existed um, was just kind of eye-opening for me and, and something that I'm actively doing. So we can maybe just jump into that a little bit and if you can just tell us sort of, sort of like what the underlying mechanism is of that condition and what the, again, the treatment options are for it. Sure, so I, um, just quickly address the question. So for patchy alopecia areata and PRP, uh, it's a new treatment modality, so people are trying it. I know some people have had some good experience in patients who didn't respond to other treatments that PRP was started and they did have a good response. But I've also heard of instances where it didn't work. And in this day and age, like PRP is, is still uh, an expensive treatment option. So it's something that needs to be weighed with their dermatologist um, before starting it. And it's it's something to consider. As you remember, we went over the different treatment options for alopecia areata. And something that has sort of, you know, fallen out of favor somewhat, but is a good treatment option is something we call immunosensitizer therapy. So alopecia areata, just so everyone knows, is a condition where the hair follicle is being attacked by the immune system. And we don't know exactly why that happens, but we do know that there's a special immune cell that is getting into the hair follicle and causing that destruction. So some of the, tr the treatments that we use, for instance, steroid injections, calm down the inflammation. So that's, that's helpful. But there's an, another treatment, which we call immunosensitizer, which is sort of geared, you can think of it as kind of distracting the immune system from attacking the hair follicle, almost like you're gonna try and wave a flare and get the immune cells to, to move away from attacking the hair follicle. So just very briefly, this is something that was uh, kind of pioneered several decades ago, and uh, it's a little bit more labor intensive, but we typically get um, these, these liquids, which are first applied to one part of the skin to sensitize you, and then they're applied to the scalp in increasing concentrations to elicit a form of a, a dermatitis or kind of a rash. And that rash, the theory is, is that that distracts the immune system away from the hair follicle in rates that are actually quite comparable to current success rates with, you know, tofacidinib or Zelgens, the new medications. You can see a very good response without the risk of immunosuppression, which especially in this day and age with, with COVID, we, we want to be mindful of. Not that there's there's been any proven risk of tofacitinib and, and COVID, but for certain people, and, and you can you can talk about this, it's a great treatment option. It's pretty safe. We can even teach you how to do it at home. It does take a little bit more effort longitudinally, but we've seen great success rates where you can have long term responses or even cures with um, with immunosensitizer therapy. Yeah, and I mean, I think what sold me on it was the, the photos that you showed me were incredible. Where half the scalp was treated with the immunosensitizers, the other half was not. And then like whatever it was, six months later, you see hair on one side of the scalp and not on the other. And so that was a pretty incredible thing to see. So the hair growth primarily is expected at the site of where you're applying the uh, the topical irritant, right? Essentially. That's right. That's right. So, and that's, that's right. So, so for me, you know, I started with the, the 2%, which is the highest uh, dose, I guess, that most people get, uh, just to begin that sensitization. And then we went down to the lowest dose, and I'm still working my way up to try to find that right dose that gives me that skin reaction that you were talking about. But uh, I guess that doesn't kind of overdo it and uh, give you like a severe rash or something like that. So we're tr still trying to find that kind of happy place for, for, for my scalp. That's right. And it's, it's a good option because you can use it in almost you know, in the pediatric population, so younger patients, and it's something that you can do at home. So you're not um, having to come to dermatologists all the time. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. And then for the eyebrows too, I've actually just been focused on the left side of the scalp, just, you know, while we're figuring out the dose, but then I do intend on treating one, one eyebrow as well, seeing if that, that helps. So we'll see as a, as a hair transplant surgeon loses his yeah. hair, <laughs> the saga <laughs> continues. Great. So hopefully that answered a question about yeah, the patchy loss and the PRP and, and gave a lot more information. So thank you for that.